So how do you overcome big challenges when you face them in real estate deals? Sometimes the bigger the deal means the bigger the challenge. So my guest today, Georgia Brew, has done just some amazing things. He has over 3,400 doors. He has a construction company as well, and he has an e-commerce business, and he faces challenges in all of those things. So George, welcome. How are you today? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Yourself? <laughs> Besides being tired with that intro, I've just even said <laughs> Yeah, you lot, just but, uh, <laughs> got yeah. me stressed out thinking about it. I know, it. <laughs> I know, right. So, but you know, you, uh, you're one of the most level-headed headed guys that I know, and how do you uh, how do you face, or how, when you face big challenges, because I know when it comes to real estate deals, some people think that, you know, you get these big deals, you get them closed, and all of a sudden there's no work to be done. And it really, uh, really nothing can be further from the truth, right? There's so many things that you don't know, even if you've done things correctly in diligence and you just things come up. So what are some challenges that you faced kind of in doing different real estate projects and how have you uh, worked through them? Yeah, I mean... I've faced several challenges, right? And, and um, the growth we've had, especially in the, in the multifamily space, um, you know, I spent 12 plus years in the single family, maybe small multifamily space and um, had conquered many challenges there. And then stepping into multifamily, um, the first one that comes to mind is, is raising equity which I think a lot of investors face that challenge. Um, I've actually been seeing it a lot lately where they underestimate, you know, what it takes to, to raise equity um, and they end up having to drop deals because they can't raise the equity. Yeah. Um, you know, my, the first syndication, so my first syndication, I did not raise any equity. I found the deal. Um, I was, boots on the ground, asset management, pretty much did everything but raise the equity. Mm -hmm. um, and then on the second deal, we had structured it sort of the same way. And the challenge that came was midway through, um, I was forced to raise equity in a sense. So mm -hmm. our, our partner that we brought in to raise the equity um, ran into some issues and, and was spread out a little too thin. So, um, you know, I was kind of thrown in, I had been setting up to raise equity. I just, you know, I started building my platform and talking to investors here and there. Um, and the plan was to do it probably in the next deal, but you know, that got thrown at me. So, um, I got it done. You know, I, I did get it done and we closed that deal. Um, I think when, when challenges come up, there, there's essentially two things you can do, right? You can um, figure out how to tackle it, come up with a plan and just go head on, or you can get scared in a sense and, and kind of just, you know, have all these beliefs and, and stop yourself from actually um, moving forward and, and getting it done. Um, I've always had the mindset of, I, I don't let things that, I can't control stress me out. So, you know, all those things, all that noise is canceled out. But when there's something that I can control, you know, I go all in. Yeah. You know, there's something you brought up that I think is really important and it has to do with mindset. You know, if you look at challenges and what this has to do with real estate, has to do with life, has to do with anything. If you look at challenges as just being like, oh, well, that sucks, or you're kind of a complaining attitude, or just life's just really hard all the time then um, you know, life will be really hard all the time. But if you're able to really translate those into growth and opportunity and realize that like nothing is wasted, right? We can learn from everything. And even from a faith standpoint, I believe that you know, God uses everything, right? Even when things don't go well and things go wrong or something terrible happens, there is some sort of redeeming thing that can be brought out of that. And it's easy to miss it. It's easy to miss the silver lining when we get bitter or we get upset. And I think, um, and you mentioned a couple examples of raising money. I remember, and I've shared this story a lot, but the idea of going to my first, you know, my, my first deal and trying to raise money and it went to 63 different friends and family and absolutely zero invested, George, but <laughs> you know, it's, it's, you learn. And then, and then, you know, yep. after a while, it's still kind of this magical ex experience when people do decide to invest, but um, you know, I actually, I'm seeing it right now. There's a deal that I'm watching some friends go through and they're raising, they're trying to raise a lot of money. They've had very little success. They may end up losing so a pretty significant amount of hard money on it just because they're having trouble. And so that's where, you know, obviously too, you want to prepare yourself for that. But um, let's talk specifically 
uh, you know, about maybe some of the, you know, stuff with construction, or I know it, the, the, the fear is, right, you buy a deal, or you get into some deal, whether it's a single family, or it's a large multifamily, and all of a sudden, oh my gosh, there's foundation issues, or oh my gosh, there's some, you know, environmental issue, especially like I mean, in California, where there's all these, you know, environment, multiple stages of environmental studies and stuff. But what, what are some things that you kind of encountered that were unexpected in some of your uh, properties you've worked on, or maybe one in particular, and, and kind of what, what have you done to kind of resolve that? You know, on the on that end, we're we're pretty detailed on the front end. I'm trying to think of, you know, something that's maybe caught us off guard. Um, I think on one of our earlier deals, we we knew we were going to have some sewer issues, um, but we kind of underestimated the what we were going to need to to take that on. So I think um, we ended up uh, spending quite a bit of our contingency on, on the sewer, which I don't usually like to spend my contingency period, but um, right. especially not a big chunk of it on, on something like sewer lines. Um, so since that, like you said, you know, that was a challenge. Well, I think as long as you learn from that challenge, then, then you're growing. Um, so from that deal on, I mean, we, we scope every single sewer line. We don't just do like a percentage, right. you know, we, we, we know exactly what we're getting into. Um, only other thing I can think of is, um, I know the first deal we were going to refi cash out out of, um, we're getting everything set up with the bank to, to do so. And, um, we had a fire <laughs> in oh, one yeah. of the buildings and that was quite a challenge. Like, um, not necessarily, dealing with the insurance loss and the construction. Cause I'm used to that, you know, that was a piece of cake. It was the speed. Like we're going to have mm -hmm. to fight the insurance for money. And we're also going to have to do this quickly at the same time so that we can refi. Um, so that was a, uh, that was a bit interesting. We, we ended up having to leave a little bit of money on the table um, as far as the negotiations with the insurance, because we had a certain deadline we had to meet for the refi um but yeah that's yeah we we've had a couple of different fires on different uh properties thankfully nobody's been hurt but uh it, you know it sets you back because you got to figure out it's just a lot of extra work and it takes time and sometimes it can actually work out in some ways okay because then the you know, insurance comes in and they uh pay for the missed time for rents or they you know you figure out different places for the tenants or housing them but uh you kind of end up getting you know new units or, or fully remodeled units afterwards but it is a pain in the butt because it's just a lot of extra work and it's a lot more to do yep. especially like you said when you've got a deadline and you've got you know that's just kind of how life is right you <laughs> there's a saying that life is what happens while you're making other plans and I think it's so true, right? It's just like, you know what, like life just happens, you know, I had a great idea and, you know, it just happened. But, um, well, let's take a little step, uh, kind of go up a little higher in the clouds in a 30,000 foot view. Why don't you talk to us a little bit about, uh, kind of your experience with multifamily and kind of what you love about it and how you got started. Just tell us a little bit of the story of kind of how you got into it. Yeah. So like I mentioned earlier, you know, I started in the, in the single family space. Um, my goal getting into this was always to to scale and to build um, something huge and something that that I could leave behind, um, I couldn't quite figure that out on the single family, um, and I had scaled it, but I just I kept r running into some roadblocks to get it to like the next level, um, and that's when I was introduced to syndications for multifamily. Uh, before that, I had no idea that you can bring together these investors and and take these properties down together. Um, and man, as soon as I I found that, like, uh, I was quickly attracted to it. I'm like, this is where it's at. This is where I need to be. I need to learn this space. Um, so I spent like the next year just underwriting everything and and getting the knowledge. Um, slowly selling off any single family and and kind of getting ready for it. Um, and then just made the transition. Um, the end of this year, I would have acquired, I just did the numbers. I'm looking at my board. Um, <laughs> nice. right under 5,900 units. Um, wow. went, yeah, goal was to hit 5,000 this year. So I surpassed that and, and, um, want to 
keep growing exponentially. You know, next year I'm I'm looking to do wow. ten thousand and. Wow, what it, that's amazing! We we added about a thousand doors this year, so we're pretty excited. But five thousand in one year—that's impressive. So and my numbers here are old. So how many doors are you at now? What's your total count? So total acquisition count is the right under fifty nine hundred. Um, okay. We also had some exits, uh, about fourteen hundred in exits. So roughly forty five hundred units under management now. Wow. That's impressive. And you guys, do you guys property manage yourselves or do you have an, a third party? Third party right now. Um, okay. It's definitely a debate whether we're bringing that in-house next, next year. <laughs> you know, I, that's always a debate, right? I, I, <laughs> with my former group I was with, it was like we debated that because you have to get to a certain size where it makes sense. But even you guys really are at that size. But ge- geographically and you know, some things, it's harder to set up, I've heard, but then you can implement systems and changes sooner and you have more information more quickly. You have more control over the process, but it's just more to do, right? It's more to yeah, set up. I mean, so it's a whole, really it's a whole other party. business. You know? Yeah, it's... it is. Well, you've only got two or three other businesses. So, you know, what <laughs> I got room for more. <laughs> I know, I know, right? Yeah, we were just talking about this before the uh, the interview started, how you know, your whole family, your wife is very much a go-getter as well. And, and really you've got a, a family at home. So uh, let's, uh, let's talk on that. How do you balance everything? I mean, how do you balance having young kids and a family and, and three businesses? That seems like a lot to try to balance. Yeah, I know the balance has, has been tough throughout the years, um, especially before when uh, my wife and I worked hand in hand together um, building the business. And, um, you know, it was hard to separate the mm-hmm. two, work and outside of work. Um, and, you know, we, we, we figured it out um, and then when we started having the kids, it was, that's when I really started building out the team because I realized I can't keep doing this and put as much attention as I would like to, to my family. Um, so that's when I really started focusing on building out my team and then, um, eventually got my wife out of there and, um, that made it a lot easier to separate as well. And, um, you know, what I do is, I try to spend quality time. So when I'm with my children, um, I'm, I'm there, um, you know, I'm not distracted. And then I think that that helps. And I also, if there's anything, I make it a point that if, um, there's something big happening, a uh, sporting event or something in their school, you know, I always make it a point to be there no matter what. Um, and that's how I find my balance. I'm not sure if it's the right balance, but but it works. It works for me. Yeah, absolutely. No, I think it's a really good topic because I think especially, you know, I, I'm not sure how old you are, George. I'm, I'm 41. And I just feel like at this time, you know, you're having kids and just wanting to be there, wanting to be around and yet also having this incredible vision and drive and just really wanting to, you know, do big things in, in business and in life. And it can be really challenging to, to, to do it all together. And it's, you know, that's the good the thing to do with kids is we don't get the time back. So we try to make those moments that we have really count. And so that's great. You're able to make some time and really be there for your, for your family and your kids. Um, let's talk a little bit more about, um, you know, building a team around you. Cause obviously it have 5,900, uh, units and, and, you know, talk to us a little bit about some things that you've discovered in building a, a good team around you. Yeah, I think it's the, the part that nobody really speaks about enough when, when you decide to start a business, um, <laughs> Uh, it's not easy. It's not easy to, to hire employees. Um, it's not easy getting business partners. Um, to me, it's, I think to, to really grow a large company, you obviously have to be able to master that. Um, and it, I've had a lot of challenges throughout the years, but I think I've, I've starting to discover the secret sauce there. And, and, um, you know, it's, you've got to one plan accordingly, right? You don't want to put yourself, your back against a wall and, and have to hire somebody just because, you know, you've taken on more than you can handle. Um, I'm not saying you want to have a bunch of employees and not have any work, but you know, you want to time it right. Um, you want to hire slowly, meaning 
look, you've got to interview them three or four times. You've got to get um, different people on your staff to interview them. Um, take your time. You know, if, it's, if you want to take a month to hire somebody, like take the month, you know, it's, uh, yeah. you know, most people don't get married to somebody. I'm not saying you're going to get, um, you know, obviously employees can come and go, but um, ideally if I bring someone on, my plan is to keep them right. You know, as, as long as I possibly can. And, and hopefully um, they'll feel the same way. Um, I think core values and, and morals, you know, making sure that you align with that individual on, on that end um, is super important. It's something I didn't pay too much attention at, at first um, when I was growing the companies and um, I should have. You know, there, there were some people that I shouldn't have let in and I did. And then I realized later on, um, you know, yeah, they're really good at sales, but just not a good person. <laughs> and, yeah. Well, then character really, yeah, that is the defining thing, right? And it's good. I think you mentioned a couple of nuggets there of hiring people before you need them or kind of know where you're going and, and get people on board. And then also having that long-term mindset to really keep them and, and obviously you want to treat them well and you want to find ways to make it win-win. And I think, you know, you've obviously done that very well. I've got a, I've got a, a few staff. I've just got a, a full-time virtual assistant in the Philippines who helps me with a lot of my content stuff. And then of course, um, uh, got, you know, video and other podcasts and stuff like that. And then I've got my partners I work more as, as partners with, but, um, you know, for you, you've got, you've got a lot of different elements that you're doing because you're, you're doing a lot more, but, uh, I wanted to also just unpack a little bit. You've, you've shared this with me in our conversations before. I think I've heard from uh, someone else about, you have some really creative things you do to help raise funds. And you've got some like e-commerce stuff that you do with that, right? Aren't you have, don't you have some creative ways that you network and you have things that you do to try to reach out to folks and share about your investments. And are these all accredited only ones you can advertise for a lot of your deals? Are they ones that you can, or how, tell us a little bit about your process there and how you've been able to do that. Yeah, we, for the most part, most of our stuff is 506 C's. So we're able to, to market. Um, we are constantly building our email list, right? So that's, that's a given in, in a sense. Um, but we do a lot to, to build that list from interviews like this and networking and um, speaking at events. Um, and then we've, we've done some marketing here and there, some online marketing. Um, not a whole lot. I think, uh, you know, as we continue to grow, that's definitely something that, that we'll start doing more of. Um, you know, some retargeting and, and Facebook or YouTube ads. Um, mainly right now, you know, it's a, it's a lot of social media. It's a lot of networking. It's a lot of going to events um, and also referrals from our existing investors. But yeah, yeah, that's where we're getting the bulk of investors. That's great. Well, I think that's something too. Obviously, we have different people that are watching this. Some are, uh, you know, investing. Some are are looking to grow their own business or get involved in syndication. But uh, it really is amazing when someone has had a great experience. Uh, they tell somebody about it, or even if you ask them that, you know, what was your experience? Or the, oh, I'm thinking of this other person, and uh, we get a lot of referrals. We're starting to get a lot more referrals now because of our performance and our relationship with people. And it really means a lot when you get a referral. And I would say even to anybody listening, I try to think of that as well. When I have a good experience, either investing as I invest passively in things outside of multifamily or even outside of our group, and just you know being able to share that that, that information along when somebody has a great experience, it really obviously means a lot. And it really helps a lot of people out. And that's the thing that I find in multifamily syndication specifically is ninety eight percent of people that should be doing this are not doing it right because they don't know about it. Yeah, and, I mean it's it's a game changer, man. You know when you take somebody, let's say. $50,000, right? And, and you give them a three a X on their money. I mean, that's, that could be a game changer for them. And, and yeah, they definitely want to start telling everybody, Hey, you're get your money out of your bank. <laughs> like, yeah, no, totally. No, it's, it's true. Yeah. Good performance and good operators. You know, they, there's a, a trail that's left and it's, it's really, really an awesome thing. Um, so what would you say for someone who's, you know, maybe never invested in multifamily syndication, uh, or really just never, you know, maybe they're doing single family like you and I were in the past. Like, what would you say to them about multifamily? Like, what would you say to someone who is interested maybe in starting, but not quite sure what to do? Yeah, I think um, we're talking about more on the act active side or, 
for yeah, passive. Let's, let's talk a little, well, we can talk to both. Hey, why don't you first talk about active, you know, somebody who's interested in doing it themselves or being a part of a team, maybe somebody who's passive, maybe you can kind of touch on both. Yeah, I would, um, from my experience, so I have, uh, especially a lot this year, I've had a lot of um, investors, beginners kind of bring me their deals. You know, I kind of put it out there that, hey, I'll, I'll code GP with you. I'll, I'll help you through the deal. Um, and what I find is a lot of them haven't put in the work. They, they haven't really done their homework. They haven't even, um, I mean, there's so much free content out there right now. I mean, mm -hmm. you can get a pretty good idea of what it takes um, to actually close a deal and, and manage it correctly. Um, and man, a lot of them just, just think that, that, uh, especially on the equity side, they, they definitely think it's just going to come, you know, um, the, the underwriting, I mean, you're, you've got to have some, um, pretty good underwriting, right? I mean, I, I feel like you should, if, if you're doing this, um, and if you're going to have investors trust you with their money, like you should be able to come up with some good projections and, and really um, know how to research the data yourself and not kind of just be guided by the brokers and, and the OM. Um, I see that way, way too often. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say, you know, one, get educated, I guess is what I'm saying, right? You know, get educated one way or another, whether you're going to pay someone to mentor you, whether you're going to Mm -hmm. uh, soak up all the free content that's out there or, um, I don't know, do an internship with somebody. <laughs> yeah. You know, there's a lot of different ways to do it. You bring up a really good point and you talk about education and we say there's really two things, you know, one is education, the other is networking. So who you meet, the people you meet, as well as getting yourself educated. And I think whether you want to be someone who is operating, who's finding the deals and more operating the assets, or you're somebody who really wants to work with people, do more of the money raising, because there's kind of different tracks. There are groups that do everything, but usually people have different roles within that. But especially if you're looking at raising money, um, it's important that you understand how a deal works. You can explain it. You can un you really, you know, I've under underwritten a hundred deals. So you've at least done a lot where you can say, Hey, these numbers, they look a little bit lofty in these areas, or you can speak intelligently to it. Cause when you know what you're talking about, people uh, pick that up. And when you don't know what you're talking about, yeah. even if people don't know it, like they can tell. So it's really well, on the same to token. I mean, you, you're going to be putting your investors in that deal too. So you want to know yeah. enough to where you're reviewing the deal sponsors uh, documents that, you know, you could tell if it's a deal or not, or you can spot some red flags. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, 100%. I think I agree. It's imp very important. So, yeah. So talk to us about uh, passive. Somebody hasn't pulled the trigger on a passive deal. Like, yeah, I know I should get in real estate, but I don't want to, or maybe I have a rental, but I don't kind of like it or I sold it or whatever. But, you know, why should someone consider uh, maybe a busy professional getting involved in multifamily as a passive investor? I mean, to me, the number one, well, there's a couple different reasons, I guess. I was going to say the number one, but then I thought of two quickly. Um, you know, one, it's, it's, it's truly passive, right? You know, once you're done, vetting the deal sponsor and, and um, looking into the deal and you send over your money, I mean, it's, that's it. The rest is passive, right? Um, you, you should at that point just begin to get updates, financials, and hopefully distributions, right? <laughs> um, so truly passive. And then I know one that's big for me is the tax, you know, the benefits, the tax benefits um, of investing in multifamily and the depreciation you can you can receive. Um, you know, I realize some individuals can claim more than that than others and, and whatnot, but um, I know that's been huge for me personally. So I think yeah, those two things. You know, if you're just investing in stocks or or you just got your four four hundred one k. I think you're doing yourself an injustice. You're doing yourself, your family. Like there's other alternative investments that that can, if you do it smart and you do your your homework and you vet whoever uh, the deal sponsor is. I mean, you can make much better returns. Yeah, I think that's it. You know, you talked a lot about education, and um, you know, I've had over 1,200 one-on-one phone calls with high net worth investors, and I've just always been amazed how 
a lot of people are very, you know, if, if people are educating themselves, it allows them to make better decisions. It sounds really simple, but it's something that not everybody does. And we don't, you know, and I don't always do it, but uh, I think just in general, the more we can learn about different types of investments, I mean, even beyond real estate, but real estate, real estate though, is it's truly is, and I don't know if you'd probably, you'd probably agree with this because you're in real estate too, but it is an unfair asset class. It's an asset class that like you basically pay little or no taxes, you can get really great returns. You don't have the volatility of the stock market, particularly in multifamily and other things. And it's just, it's awesome. So uh, on that note, and just kind of as we're wrapping up here, George, um, what, let's, let's talk about kind of what's next. What do you see is ha- going to happen next in the multifamily market? Do you have any predictions as far as obviously we have this money printing? We've got, you know, they're talking about raising rates. Like what, what do you kind of see happening in the next, you know, six to 12 months here? Six to 12 months? Um you know, I, a lot has happened right in the last year, two years. Um, I think multifamily has definitely stood out from all other, maybe a couple more real estate um, asset classes that, um, have also performed really well, but I think that's going to continue to attract a lot of money towards it. Like it is now, um, you know, inflation, is real, right? Um, and it's happening. So leaving money, it, when people start realizing that if you're just leaving money in your account, you're actually losing money because mm-hmm. of the rate of inflation. Yeah. So it makes 100% sense to put that into a real asset like multifamily. Um, and at that point, you've got other drivers to, to raise that value um, and you don't just have it sitting outside losing money. Um, so I, I think it's going to continue to be hot, you know, for the six, six to 12 month outlook. I think, um, interest rates is going to really, um, maybe sway the market one way or the other, or maybe that's going to start to soften the market. Sure. Um, if the rates do go up, um, you know, I don't see the cap rates going much higher and I know they're getting compressed and compressed. Um, maybe the compression will, will slow down or stop, but I don't see them shooting back up to, you know, 6%, 7%. I don't, I, I don't see anything like that anytime soon. Yeah, I think, I think I agree. I think that if rates do rise, which they probably will, it'll be gradual over time. And even then, I, I kind of look at it and think that, you know, when you have rates go up, it basically, the asset costs more to own, which is really translated to an increased cost of ownership, which really goes, you know, will be, I think, passed down to tenants as far as rents, as well as inflation driving rents to go higher as well. So it'd be interesting to see. I don't know necessarily that prices will, they could soften a little bit, but um, it just will be interesting to see even if cap rates uh, rise a little bit, it doesn't mean that necessarily that values will go down because it could actually mean that you know, the rents people are paying are continuing to go up. So it's interesting, I, interesting, interesting concept. We just did an event on this recently, which was really great with you and a couple other guys talking about kind of what was happening or what's coming up in the future. So I appreciate you sharing that for this uh, audience as well. Well, George, I just wanted to say, um, really appreciate you. Um, you. You know, you add so much to the uh, conversation as far as, you know, uh, because of your construction background, the different things that you've done and just the ability you've, you've, you've been able to scale is really impressive. And the way that you you can describe about how you treat investors and how you look at deals. So I just wanted to say, really appreciate you. I want to honor you for that. So thank you for what you brought here today and what you bring to the entire multifamily and investor community. So appreciate you having you on today. Uh, what's a great, good way for uh, people to get in touch with you? Uh, best way is probably visit my website. So elevatecig.com stands for commercial investment group. So elevatecig.com. Um, they can also shoot me an email, which is Jorge, J O R G E, um, at elevatecig.com. And yes, I go by George, but I also get called Jorge. <laughs> And it's spelled Jorge. So. <laughs> I was going to start calling you Jorge because I've been calling you George for so long. And I think I asked yeah, no, I, I definitely go by George um, yeah. if somebody asks me my name. But um, yeah, if they shoot me an email and they say they, they heard me here um, on your podcast, um, I can send them some free content. All right. That's awesome. Well, George, thanks again for coming today. We'll have to have you back in the future. Really appreciate you adding value today. 